morning, everybody. Um, so I've I've um, I've been investing in this uh, strategy in quoted companies, many small quoted companies, since about two thousand six. And I I ran uh, was the lead manager of another investment trust called Strategic Active Capital for about seven and a half years, mid two thousand nine to early seventeen. And I set up with with Ed Vilhofsky in, in, in Armitage Edison Capital in uh, in 2018. And we launched this investment trust in May 2018. And uh, we're, we're a bit unusual from, from many other quoted fund managers that you might come across because we've spent more of our careers actually in private equity rather than public equity. And that mindset really drives what we're trying to achieve for, for our investors. And that's really to try and make people money as opposed to beat an index. And... What we're looking to do is to is effectively double uh, the NAPA share every five years, which is the equivalent of a 15% return by investing in, in, in quoted companies. Now, we don't use gearing in this trust. We typically run with net cash. So it's all about stock selection uh, and stock selection and engagement in our particular way. Uh, working for companies that uh, specifically, as we come on to a bit more, is you know where there's an opportunity, for, there's a valuation opportunity in a company that can be improved. Now, on top of that, over the years, we, we're very concentrated investor. We typically have up to 20 holdings. Uh, we tend to shy away from a number of companies that uh, that do things that people deem unethical. And early this year, uh, after consultation with shareholders, the, the trust put in a formal ethical investment restriction policy, which effectively is negative screening. So from an ESG perspective, we have both negative screening, but also we engage with portfolio companies as well, which we believe is, is pretty unique in our part of the market. Now, in terms of returns, we are there to do the right thing, we think, but also we're there to make money, um, but we don't benchmark ourselves. We, we uh, normally present uh, an index as a comparator to basically show how we're doing long term against the market. Uh, but we have periods where, uh, you know, our performance is very, very different to the broader market. And we tend to find over time we get most of our outperformance in down and sideways markets and we give back performance when markets suddenly rally and get quite frothy. Now, to do that really requires us as a manager to think and act differently, we think, to our broader peer group. So if you can move on to the next slide, Matt. Before we get into the, uh, the meat and bones of what we do, I think it's worth talking a little bit about the investment trust sector as well, because, uh, you know, in our opinion, being around the investment trust sector for many, many years, in, in the case of one of our non-execs, he's run investment trusts, I think, since 1975. Uh, Ian was, was very involved with, with setting up and running HG Capital Trusts. We don't believe every investment trust has a right to exist. Uh, and there are many strategies which you can which you can very effectively run through OICs. We could not run our strategy through an OIC, which is one of the reasons why we think it deserves to exist as a trust. It's a very differentiated strategy with a very differentiated performance profile. And frankly, it doesn't work in an OIC. Um, the second thing you need as well as the investment approach is, is, is basically uh, people who really fine. know what they're doing. If you take Ed and I, we've, we've had about 34 um, years of experience investing in these them. smaller companies. Yeah. Uh, and our non-execs of the asset management company add another 80 years of that. Um, okay. So we, we do understand our space. We've invested through cycles and we've seen lots and lots and lots. On top of that, we have three experienced industry advisors oh, yeah. who are like a, um, yeah. effectively they're like a panel of advisors who help us with due diligence. And they also help us sometimes on engagement and engagement strategies. Yeah. Um, they're like, you know, one of them created the FTSE 250 company Spectrus, who's been chairman of many companies. Another one ran Bain strategy consultants in the UK. So they've seen a lot of things over the years. Yeah, so it would be we don't have any conflicts with open-ended products. Um, it's, you know, it is the trust that we run. And we have a culture of long-term skin in the game that aligns yeah. our interests with our Great. clients. All right. Now, Thank the you. final thing of trust um, is also making sure that uh, we practice what we preach. And the whole business feels very strongly about this. Um, when we set up the trust, it, as, though, as many people know, it's quite hard to, uh, to launch an equity investment trust. In fact, many have failed over the last uh, two or three years. You have to make sure that you start from scratch with your own shell alignments so that effectively you're, you're practicing what you preach to your portfolio companies. We have a fully independent diverse board. Uh, they've got considerable skin in the game. Um, they own about 1% of the trust between them alongside the managers only about 10. Um, and they also reinvest all their directors fees every quarter in buying shares in the market. So effectively their, their shareholding continues to increase over time. 
Uh, we have an outfit called Frostro Capital, which some people on the call might know. They provide a lot of non-investment support, which we think is an excellent separation of investment management and risk. And finally, we have very, very robust contemporary discount control tools, which were actually designed with some of the key opinion leaders at the large wealth managers before we launched. So effectively, we went to the shelves and said, what do you want to see from a shelf protection? And we'll deliver you what we can within the strategy. We have a redemption facility currently every seventh year, and we also have a buyback policy where if we have a takeover of a portfolio company, if the shares are trading at more than a 5% discount leading up to the exit there, half the profits from the, uh, from the takeover are used to buy back shares. So we think it's pretty unusual in the sector. And again, just to reiterate, it's absolutely essential that you practice what you preach when you're trying to drive change in your own portfolio companies. So moving on to the next slide, um, it's worth saying that you don't engage for engagement's sake. Engagement is there to augment stock selection. And we're very, very clear about that. You know, quite often we talk about the mix of, you know, is a, you know, when we, when we have an exit, is, an is it an investment success and is it an engagement success? And when both those combine together, you can generate very, very powerful returns. Now, the key is, you know, we're not looking to find dogs. We're not to try and turn around companies that are basically in a mess and that are cheap and maybe don't have a future. Um, and equally, we're not looking to try and tinker with companies that are very highly rated and, and doing good things. What we're specifically looking for is a valuation opportunity and a company that is misvalued and undervalued by the market in some way. Where that fundamental business is or has the potential to be really high quality, and the third lens is basically where the company is not firing all cylinders, where engagement can improve some aspect of the company's behaviour or perception uh, or, or, or performance. Um, as I said, we're looking to make 15% IRR across the cycle on each investment, uh, but we don't look at that as a, as a sort of a, 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 just a simple threshold. We look for every investment on the basis, is there a very, very high chance of us making 15% IRR? Is there a very low chance of losing money, but is there also upside surprise where we could make a significant better return than 15% IRR? Now, we work in a, a particularly defined market, um, uh, and because of the experience that Ed, Ian, myself, and our panel advisors have with sector focus, so we spend virtually all of our time looking at companies in the technology, medium, telecom sector, healthcare, industrial services, because we like to think and act as if we were a trade buyer. Uh, and a lot of the analysis we do on companies is trying to look at it through the lens of a trade or private equity buyer. And again, you can't do that with every sector in the market. That's also augmented by the, the negative screen that we put in. So today is really to talk about engagement, which is the sort of the third lens we look at. And if, if Matt, you can move to the, the next slide, please. Um, we see engagement as being there to augment returns and stock selection. And it's a key part, we think, of the differentiated performance profile that, that the trust delivers. And most of the performance our trust delivers is due to what's happening in a company level rather than what's going on in the underlying markets, whether or not they're going up or down. Now, we engage because we think there's an opportunity to, to not just create value to make things better. Within small companies, it's also to defend value. It's to stop management teams doing things that are going to destroy value. Uh, and that's sort of proactive engagement. And the final one is if things have gone wrong and you can't get out because of liquidity and some of these stocks can be quite a liquid, you need to make change to get the company, company rehabilitated so you can actually get value back. Now, we've been doing it for quite a long time. And this requires a, a good network, not just with industrialists and peers and, and competitors and, and suppliers uh, and customers. It's also about understanding who's who in the director's world, who's good, who's bad. Who's the corporate broker? What do they really think that's going on in the, in the company? Um, you know, and we get a lot of our you know insights into what's going on in the company in terms of behaviours and potential from 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 that network. And we think actually we're understanding the business and its potential is the key. So a bit like uh, Joe was saying, oh, you want to be uh, ideally the best informed investor about a company and its prospects. Um, part of the network also is our peers in the sector. Um, so other fund managers and if you want to drive through change you really need to get the buy-in from many other people around the register you can't you can't go and get change through 
when it's significant change with a minority of one. And we find as uh, over time, more and more money is concentrated in few and fewer hands in the small cap world. It's typically a, a couple of handfuls of people you need to have relationships with. So if you call up the fund manager at BlackRock or, or Schroeder's or somewhere like that, they know who you are and they're open to having a discussion. Now, historically, we've 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 come from a, um, a background focusing on corporate governance and financial performance, um, as you can see from the blue dots around the schematic on the right. Um, increasingly, over the last 12 months, we've been more focused as well on, on uh, environmental and social disclosure, which I'll, I'll come and talk about later. Um, what do we look for? Well, before we invest, we're looking for companies that can improve themselves in some way and where that improved potential is not priced in effectively. Um, historically, we've found a lot of companies that are not making operating margins or put the profits they should because of inefficiencies, either resource inefficiency in terms of gross margin or alternatively the overheads being too high. And quite a lot of that we, we find over the years is, is through companies that have built themselves up through M&A, the boards and the management has done all the exciting things about buying companies, but quite often the boring, grinding job of integrating those companies hasn't happened. You know, we, we've got one portfolio company, for example, where they never integrated the financial systems and the IT systems of their acquisitions, and they had 30 IT systems. And they needed to, and they went through a process with a new management team to consolidate, consolidate that to uh, a small handful. Um, that ended up being significant cost savings because you ended up selling a lot of or not um, uh, not paying for a lot of licenses, you know, pay for smaller licenses. And also there was a lot of cost behind supporting lots and lots of different systems. Um, and that's that's one example. Quite often we see poor financial control, not necessarily about getting the numbers out, but actually poor cost control. We had a portfolio company that had a cost base of about two hundred and thirty million pounds and 100 million of that was unallocated cost. And we know through history that a lot of that cost, if it's not allocated, it doesn't have an owner, it's not managed. And typically with a, a focus on that called a zero-based budget, which this company did, uh, uh, did look at, um, you can actually get at least 10 to sometimes 20% reduction in that unallocated central overhead of that size. For those of you who don't know, a zero-based budget isn't a standard budgeting process. A standard budgeting process would typically take last year's costs at inflation. A zero-based budget turns it on its head and says, actually, you know, we have a revenue, say, of £250 million. Um, what cost base should we need to run the business with that type of turnover and that, uh, and that type of sales profile? So it effectively rebuilds what cost you should have rather than what, you, what you're starting with. It's a very rigorous exercise and you would typically not do it every year and you need help to do it, but typically we see significant savings. And that's one of the things we talk to portfolio companies about. Uh, complexity, a number of our portfolio companies have, they're sort of mini conglomerates and quite often the shares are trading at a significant discount to some of the parts. And because some of these companies have different divisions, quite often we find there's, there's misallocation of capital. You know, ideally if you've got three divisions and one's not growing, you should have that as the cash cow and put all your capital into your growth division if it's particularly capital hungry to create more share of value. Whereas quite often because of politics and history, more capital gets put into the business that basically doesn't have much growth and it becomes quite ineffective. So again, we've seen that and that's one of the things we challenge with our portfolio companies. Uh, another one is, is, is investorations, which I'll come and talk about specifically. But hopefully you get the picture that we look at a company as if we were a 100% owner, what could this company be doing better? And, uh, and what can we do to try and help affect that change and improve it? To give you a, a picture of what it looks like, if you move on to the next slide, Matt. These are the top 14 holdings. Matt, can you just go ahead a slide, please? Yeah, so we identify before we invest, what the potential is in every portfolio company so we know before we get involved where the potential upside is and what can be done to improve it and then we look at actually what's the impact of improvement uh, what's the likelihood of getting change and how long is it going to take and we basically cross-reference all of those against where we spend our time engaging with companies now what you can see very clearly from the schematic is virtually every company in our top 14 has a margin improvement opportunity 
And the vast majority of that margin improvement opportunity is driven by management behavior of doing something different with the business. It's not about operational gearing through just selling more. Uh, a really good example, our biggest company, Alimentus, uh, it's a specialty chemicals producer. Um, it's uh, previous peak operating a profit was $154 million. Over the, since 2018, uh, they uh, are in the process and have taken a lot of cost out, equivalent to about $37 million of cost. Part of that's through reorganizing management and overheads. It's also changed their manufacturing footprint and becoming more efficient in doing what they're doing. And they, they've set up a new uh, personal care uh, facility in India, which will make them the lowest cost producer um, for that particular product line in the world. So there's a real structural cost savings that are being put through the business not reliant on, on operational gearing. Um, asset utilization, a lot of the companies we look at, we, we don't just look at asset heavy companies that have got property or capital backing. We also look at assets in, in IP, you know, in terms of IP and knowledge in a business. A fantastic example is, is a company called SAR, which is a global market leader in a particular niche in um, bulkhead uh, inkjet um, uh, printer heads, uh, typically historically used mainly in the ceramic tile printing industry, but increasing in, in other verticals as well. Uh, when we invested in that company, the enterprise value was 57 million pounds. And uh, that, I think it had a net, of the market cap was 77 million. But the enterprise value didn't take into account the fact that they had, um, uh, they also had some other cash coming in through saying a JV that was loss making. We actually got into that business almost for free for a company that generated 50 million of revenue. Now, the company has developed its unique IP over many years. The management team's view was that to recreate the knowledge and the IP of the business would probably take 300 million pounds today and cost five years. And then on top of that, the factory, which was in the books for 10 million, was actually insured for 100 million. So have you look at that, there's potentially sunk cost of maybe today to replicate the business 400 million. The company's EV is about 50. There's a lot of opportunity to do a lot more with those assets and that know-how than, than, than that's being done at the moment. We talked a bit about M&A. Um, what's quite interesting on, on the flip side in terms of governance and pay, you can see actually there are you know, pay is not something we focus that much on. We want to make sure that broadly interests are aligned, but, you know, uh, and we want to make sure the boards are, you know, there's a good balance of the right type of non-execs and, and execs versus non-execs, et cetera. But that's rarely uh, an issue that, that we tend to engage on. It's much more about actually the running the business and the strategy. Um, two things I'd like to just touch on briefly, um, investor relations and, and ESG performance, because those are sort of some quite interesting nuances that we've done much more about in the next, over the last couple of years. So moving on to the next slide, Matt. Um, this is uh, some examples. I think we talked about B. This was the, the TMT company. Um, this was a company that had made mid-teens operating margins. Um, and when we invested, it was making between eight and nine percent margins. We benchmarked that company, and this was the one that implemented a zero-based budget. We bought in at 0.9 times EV sales. Our view is it, it should get back to at least 1.7 times EV sales, probably 1.8 times EV sales in independent business, and was probably worth more to a trade buyer. Um, it actually delivered a lot of the things that, that we anticipated doing. This is the one that invented a zero-based budget. Uh, and ultimately, it became prey and was taken over by, uh, by an industry peer who saw what we'd seen. The company was only partway through actually executing its self-help strategy, but the trade buyer saw the opportunity of what could be achieved that the market had missed and decided to put quite a big premium on it. Um, Example A was a manufacturing business. Um, this had been a, a, again, another sort of M&A growth story where things hadn't probably been pulled together that well. It had grown its sites by 10x over 15 years via acquisitions and, and, uh, and uh, its own rollouts. It also owned its freeholds. When we invested in the company, the market cap was equivalent, we felt, to the just the property backing the business. The stated return on capital was 8%. Um, but actually, the, the asset base of the company was understating the accounts. We felt the real return on capital was about 4%. The working capital to sales was 15% or, or more, and it was making 5% margins, which we felt was very low compared with the international peers that we benchmarked against. Now, in this case, um, this was in a, in a previous company, but working with um, one of the people at Harwood, 
we work to basically put together a campaign to get them to improve efficiency, focus on return on capital and working capital, um, and effectively drive efficiencies through the business. Now, in this case, actually, the same chief exec stayed with the business, and all the, although he'd been there 20 years, but with a new chairman coming in, they really put the change agenda through. And several years later, they'd effectively uh, closed 20% of the manufacturing base. They hadn't really lost in sales. They just transferred it to other sites, which meant utilisation went up. The closure costs were funded by sales of the freehold assets and also um, a release of working capital. And they also, as you can see from the numbers on the right, they actually took at least 10 percentage points out of working capital, uh, which was, uh, I think, something akin to about 25% uh, of the market cap when we invested. So it was a great success story and all the shareholders made a lot of money out of that investment. Um, the final example is, is again, another company, uh, company C that had been built by acquisition again. Um, the operating margins, the gross margins when we invested were below its peers. And it had bought a lot of sites again and not integrated that. Um, it had to integrate its purchasing. So they had 15 different units all purchasing the same products from the same suppliers and they had no ability to tell you what those purchasing terms were both in terms of price but also payment terms and they were they're all different across 15 business units so effectively um, there needs to be a significant change in this company and an improvement to actually pull together and get the benefits of what you've what you bought and stop buying anything else um, by integrating purchasing onto one system um, they basically made savings equivalent to about 30 percent of operating profit which is very, very significant. And that's just by harmonizing uh, the, the, the price and the payment terms that they were paying for, uh, uh, for all the different parts across their different business units. Um, and we think there's, there's a lot more to go for in this company. And it's one of our portfolio companies at the moment. So hopefully that gives you a flavor for some examples. Moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the other things we, we talked about is chairman change there. Um, we think a change agenda needs to be driven by, uh, by a change actually right at the top of the company. And typically we see an interesting uh, lag between a new chairman coming in and really a significant share price performance, typically 18 months later. What you tend to find is the chairman comes in, there's three to six months of review, the rot starts to stop. Typically there'll be exact change and then a new exec will start to execute change. And that, that said, that takes typically 12 to 18, 12 months to come through in behaviors and numbers, 18 months to really start generating significant alpha out of the investment. And what you can see here from our portfolio, we have a very, very high proportion of our investee companies that have had chairman change since the beginning of 2019. And we're very, very excited about the potential for, for performance from all of these companies over the next few years. If you look at things that have been in the portfolio for a bit longer, so in the case of Kemring and NCC, you know, they've delivered a big leg of relative performance over the overall period of ownership, and they're, they're more mature investments for us now. Moving on to the next slide. Um, you know, th this is a really good example of the lag effect. This was, um, this was a big investment that I made at SEC in a company called ETV Technologies. And as you can see from the chart, um, and the reason we've put this one up uh, as a previous investment, it really shows you how you can get really great returns over the long term through backing companies at the right point through this change. The grey line you can see at the bottom is the underlying index, the equivalent market, small cap market. The light blue line is the electronic sector, and the dark blue line is the is basically the share price of, of this company. Now, um, the company got itself into a bit of a mess. It was a global market leader, very high IP. In some cases, the only person in the world that could do what they did in certain products. It had been a, 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 not a great experience for shareholders between its float in 2004 and when we'd invested in 2009. I think it had generated 3% annual returns, uh, which was you know, well below its cost of capital um, and also well below the market. Now we saw a company that actually needed a balance sheet fix, but actually wasn't growing as fast as it should have done organically and hadn't integrated acquisitions and hadn't really got the value out of what it had done. Uh, and we were buying at a very, very good point of the cycle. Uh, this was this had just after the great financial crisis um, and we, we got in on a balance sheet funding, uh, refunding. Now, what you can see is um, and our initial thesis was, look, even if there's no improvement in the business, we should make two to three times our money. 
And you can see in the first couple of years, that's effectively what happened. And then we had the difficult decision to say, you know, even though the company is still not doing a lot of things right, we've made money, what do we do? And we made a specific decision to, to engage with a couple of other shareholders to, to basically get some board change through. And you can see in July 2012, uh, the, the chairman announced that he was, he was going to leave by the next AGM. It took nine months for new chairman to get in uh, and uh, a very capable uh, chairman came in. And what you can see there, that's a real point of relative performance starts to change and absolute and relative performance start to increase. And the second phase of that investment under the new chairman, as you can see, wasn't just good in, in terms of absolute terms, it was much better in the sector. So you can argue the first couple of years were basically sector bet, but the second half of that investment is all about this company improving itself to the point where ultimately uh, a very well-respected and well-funded trade bidder saw value in the company and, 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 and took it out. Now, over the period of that investment, I think it made about six times return uh, and clearly a, a very good absolute and relative uh, investment. Lots of change. They sold assets, they bought assets, they refocused R&D, they implemented lean manufacturing, and there was significant board change around that process to do that. I think the key, the other key thing to look at there is the returns you get from these situations aren't linear, and therefore what it's quite good to have a portfolio of them because they all tend to be driving significant performance in different phases. So you, you do need a sort of maturity effect coming through. Um, moving on to a big part of that is not just about an improvement, but on the next slide, uh, what you can see is uh, it's all about communicating that as well. So in the same way that those of you who invest in investment trusts can see that a company that markets itself well in the trust sector tends to have a better rating. It's exactly the same that we find as small caps, um, but it's, you know, it's a number of years behind arguably in the sophistication of trusts. So quite a lot of the time we look at a company and say, actually, you know, you don't have the rating you've got because the liquidity is low and you don't have the shells that you should have given the done outs your net of your business. We think the investment case could be sold better. Can we introduce you to a couple of people that help portfolio companies like you? Um, and we've seen some pretty staggering results on that. Uh, you know, in one case, um, they they hired a guy after introduction who I think cost the company forty thousand. By improving the IR, they suddenly got liquidity up, and the company re-rated by thirty or forty percent relative to its sectors, uh, relative to its sector peers in the year. And that generated, I think, about 50 or 60 million of shareholder value. And we pointed to the company and said, that's probably the best way you're going to spend shareholders' money that we can think of. Um, so, so we do, do do that. I think that aligned with that, if you move on to the next slide, what we've also been doing is, is looking at companies' ESG footprint. Um, Matt, so you can move on to the next one, please. Um, so... Uh, for those of you who've looked at ESG, you'll be aware that, uh, that the big rating agencies, number one, don't have any consistency, and number two, don't tend to focus on smaller companies. So it's a bit of a black box. And we've partnered with uh, a niche provider of, of bespoke ESG reports, um, and we believe we're one of the only small cap managers in the UK that produces ESG reports on all of its portfolio companies. Now, um, what we're looking for here really is is companies improving their disclosure because we think that over time improved disclosure drives improved behavior. If you look at remuneration or if you look at board constitution and, and dura uh, duration of directors, if companies didn't have to report on these, they would probably not, not be behaving in a, in, a, in a proper way. So effectively, that's what we think really drives behavior. What we've tended to find across our portfolio is um, companies have been very keen to engage with us. They hadn't seen any type of analysis like this, and we, we share the reports with the companies. And then we offer a consultation with the advisor who then can basically help them understand why they score, where they do, and potentially what the gaps are and how they can improve. And what we're looking for is a direction of travel and improvement for, for all of our companies. What we found is that a lot of companies are doing very good things, but they're not disclosing it in an appropriate way or in, in quite the right way, which means that when the big rating agencies start to look at them, they're going to underscore their, what they're actually achieving, which potentially can create problems with some of the bigger shelter groups. Um, so it's been very well received, and we think it's it's in the environment we're in at the moment. If our portfolio companies are ahead of the curve here, they hopefully should attract more capital as, as the broader fund management industry gets more concerning. Well, sorry. So moving on to the next slide, I think um, hopefully uh, 
hopefully as we've gone through this, uh, it's it's clear that you know we want to make money um, from from obviously picking interesting investment situations, but actually a key part of our strategy is actually working with these companies and and, and using corporate engagement to enhance those returns and stock selection. Um, and our focus is investing in companies that are fundamentally sound, but could and should be doing quite a lot better. So yeah, invest in good and hopefully sell excellent at a price that reflects excellent. Um, historically, it's delivered quite different returns to our broader peer group. Um, you know, our correlation with our peers is, 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 is negligible. Um, and then the key question we get asked is, well, surely all these companies have sorted themselves out? No, absolutely not. We always are finding companies that could and should be better. I asked the same question when I came to the sector in 2006. And there's always companies that through what's going in the sectors, what's going in the broader economic markets, but also what's going with their own management teams. You know, there's there's always scope to find companies that could and should be doing better. And that's where why we're very confident of continuing to make good long-term returns. Okay, I think it's now time to take some questions. There's been quite a few that's come through on the Q&A. So if I kick this off, um, first question, Stuart, how big a percentage of a company do you think you need to hold to be listened to and sort of gain or gain the influence that you need to achieve your engagement objectives? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we have engaged very successfully with some of our portfolio companies owning less than 1% by talking to them about ESG um, and also investor relations, um, because we're coming in and talking with them about something that all their bigger shareholders probably wouldn't talk to them about. Where we need, where we find bigger stakes and more important is really driving an agenda around particularly a board change situation that we'd like to see happen or a significant strategic or restructuring uh, uh, initiatives such as selling uh, a division or alternatively driving through significant improvement of margins. So it all depends on really what you're trying to engage on and what you're trying to achieve. But also who else is on the register? We, we have one at the moment where we're not disclosable, we own less than 3%, um, but we've proactively gone to talk to other shareholders who, who uh, and we're in sort of discussions with them um, on a non-control seeking uh, initiative and they own I don't know, 15% of the company. Um, but, but, but we're the one that proactively approached them and said, actually, you know, we think some change needs to happen here. So it all depends on the register, what you're trying to achieve, um, uh, and also where you have relationships around the company. Um, obviously, poor governance can negatively impact valuations. With regards to your space, I mean, how much do you think the sort of E and the S of ESG um, impact valuations? I think it's an excellent question. I think if you, at the moment, look, a really good example, I would, I would say, is um, Accentra. We don't own Accentra. It's the old Phil Troner business. Um, they were operating, part of their business was manufacturing um, cigarette filters. Uh, as you know, a lot of investors don't want to invest in anything to do with tobacco, and they wouldn't invest in the company despite the shares being very cheap. A couple of weeks ago, they announced that they were going to sell that division and the shares re-rated 30%. Mm. So from, from, a, from an ENS perspective, that was a very, very material change in the valuation of that company um, once they decided to exit that activity. We, we saw it on Kemring as well. Um, we, we didn't have the, the, the ENS framework we do now when we invested in Kemring, but one of the things that they, uh, they were doing was uh, their business operations was, was basically sourcing 40 millimeter, which is effectively grenades um, for, for use of people around the world. And we found that activity pretty unpleasant actually. Ed and I had a big think about whether we wanted to invest in a company that provided that. And, the rest of Kemring actually are products really to promote and save lives um, in, in the aerospace and, and defence industry. And one of the things we did when we, when we invested, we said to the company, look, why are you doing this? Um, it's really low quality earnings. Um, it, it's got very low sales visibility. It does things that people just don't like. We think if you exited that activity, even if you sold it for a lower rate in the rest of the group and you lost the earnings, so it's earnings diluted, we think the rest of the group will re-rate because more people are interested in buying your company because you don't do that anymore. And that's broadly what happened. 
So, you know, I think it does. Um, you know, there are certain investors that won't invest in anything related to defence industry, which we think is is slightly too hair shirted. Um, uh, but uh, ultimately, it's 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 forcing companies to actually have a real think about how they run themselves, what they do, and do they actually want to be there? Um, and we've seen actually quite significant positive catalysts when they're taking proactive changes uh, to do that. If a board refuses to engage and other shareholders don't want to do anything, do you walk away? Or I suppose arguably, is that somewhere that you probably wouldn't be invested in the first place? Uh, well, we'd hope we'd never get to that position because we'd have done our due diligence first. So a key part of our due diligence is understanding the nature of the people around the board. We, we, we obviously meet the execs before we invest, uh, but we also try and get a temperature and do referencing around who the non-execs are, have they been change agents before, are they generally perceived to be shareholder friendly or not? Um, you know, do they own reasonable amount of shares in the company? And then we also do analysis on the other shareholders before we invest as well. So, uh, you know, when we go and engage, we only want to engage in something we think we've got a very, very high chance of winning. Otherwise, it can be a total time sink and, it, and you know, it can be quite emotional, and quite frustrational if it, if it doesn't go the way you want. Um, if for whatever reason we've misjudged that and we're just not going to put the change through, there is no point in banging your head against a brick wall. You move on. Yeah. Okay. And we, I should say we never go public. Uh, there's just no upside. Um, the ideal situation for us is engaging with the company in private, the company coming out with some good news or some 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 good change and then them getting all the plaudits because they own it then and and it's much more effective to do it that way rather than people hate being told what to do <laughs> absolutely um when does a holding get too big for the fund and how do you manage this hmm. So we have, a, we have a limit on 15% of the NAV at the time of purchase. In reality, we, we don't really buy above 12% of NAV. Um, the, we would probably mechanically top slice at 15. Uh, the only situation that's happened, I'm looking at Ed, was our biggest holding got taken over as SDL. And I think it went to, at one point the peak to 17% of NAV. And we automatically sold it down um, to, to 15 and then dependent on how the bid was going to go, exited, gradually exited later on. Okay. You often seem to have a lot of cash. Would you consider using gearing? And is there a debt facility in place? So, um, yeah, if you look at the strategy over the long term, we've generated pretty strong returns despite running with a, with a cash balance. I think uh, the, the average over the time at SEC was about seven to eight. And typically we're running at mid mid high single digits which 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 i don't think is is that high now the reason we do it is because uh, a lot of the stocks that we sometimes we get buying and we can look at a situation for years before investing and then suddenly the liquidity comes in you never want to be a forced seller to buy stocks you want so it's effectively a bit like a float and you know, two weeks ago we spent six percent of the nav and uh, you know buying stock in the market in the block which was probably almost six months trading volume and we could do that because of the cash. And we think that the ability to be able to behave like that and act like that outweighs any potential cash drag. Uh, we don't have a debt facility. Um, I've found over, over the years, small debt facilities for small trusts uh, are not that effective. Uh, when you want it, you can't get it. And when you don't want it, you're offered it. And uh, if you don't utilize the facility, it's actually pretty expensive for shareholders. So we, we, we don't do that. What's the overlap between this and other hardwood funds? In terms of names, there's about three names that are uh, that we have an overlap, and one of those um, is more recent because of the investment management contract win that Hards had for Gresham House Strategic, where there's one one overlapping holding. But in that case, we own, in fact, in two uh, two of the cases, we own significantly more shares than Harwood. Okay. How big is the investment team that's working on the trust? So in terms of the day-to-day, -day, it's, it's Ed and myself full-time, uh, and this is all that Ed and I do. Uh, we, Ian Armitage, who's the chairman of the management company, he um, he basically sits on our research committee with us. We have, uh, said so the three panel advisors we meet uh, every month with, who probably spend a day a month with us, um, and, and we have a separate trader. So we don't, one, one of the key competitive advantages we think we've got uh, several is the fact we have a dedicated trader who, who, who does trading for us as well. And particularly in small, less liquid companies, that we think that's a significant strategic advantage. 
Okay, thanks. Um, so a couple of times you've mentioned taking a trade buyer perspective when assessing the value in companies. Do you interrogate a company's supply chain and how useful do you find this? As much as we can, yes. I think um, the, the key, um, I mean, most of the trade buyers tend to be peers or alternatively um, somebody who's looking to exit, uh, so ent enter a particular niche. I mean, a real example is the bid for Vectura by Philip Morris, which I don't think anybody in the world saw coming, maybe other than the people at Philip Morris. Uh, Vectura was, a, was a, 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 an inhaled pharma business. Um, so uh, we, we want a pretty good view of uh, where a company sits in its supply chain, how strong are its suppliers relative to the company, you know, how strong and how diverse are they, and, and same for customers as well. So we will spend time taking probably more looking at customers actually rather than suppliers itself, because we want to try and understand really why a company is, you know, why a company has a right to exist, why customers buy off them, and and what are their criteria when buying. And the nature of the companies we we invest in price tends to be one factor but typically not in the top two or three criteria and and, and that's why we like those companies super um so in terms of investing companies how frequently would you say that you need to seek adjustments in board or management how easy is it to bring, or how easy is it to bring this about and what sort of strategies do you use to achieve it so how often how often uh, do you think yeah. you would need to change sort of boards and management how easy is this to achieve and what strategies yeah. do you use yeah okay so how often sometimes it's just the normal chain of events so um we might invest in a company after there's been a chairman change but where actually the market hasn't seen the nature of the chairman and the nature of the change being a catalyst for change. As I mentioned, they, they tend to go through a roll of about 12 to 18 months before you really see it coming through in business behaviour. And bluntly, we, we arbitrage some of those situations by, by referencing the management and the new chairman and working out why they're there and how engaged they're going to be in and, and what they think the future of the company, what direction the future of the company is going to go in. Um, where we have to put through proactive change it's it's not straightforward. I mean, the days of EGMs and kicking people off boards are sort of largely gone. Very few, there are very few public situations now. Normally, it's a situation where the top shareholders will um, will decide that change is needed, and effectively, change will be done in private. The more you own, the easier it is. Um, yeah. We don't specifically talk about situations where we have uh, in print where we have proactive change chairman, but we are involved in probably at least one a year, sometimes two a year across the portfolio. It's that type of, that type of process. Um, what, what, what we have found in the past as well is if there's a particular sticky chairman that maybe has been there too long or isn't appropriate, um, we, we like annual re-election of directors. Typically what would happen is to, to have a discussion with uh, the broker and other shareholders to say, look, we think the chairman needs to move on. We're minded to vote for his re-election at this AGM, but only if he agrees that he's not going to stand for the next one. And that's done in public. And you see that quite a lot of the time. Um, so effectively, no one gets the black mark of having lots of votes against them. And you get through change in a relatively measured way. The biggest risk then becomes actually if there's a culture and governance problem around the board um, that without intervention, you might jump from the frying pan into the fire and get somebody worse taking over. <laughs> so, so that tends to be the bigger, the bigger risk. Brilliant. Okay, it's 11.15. Um, so thank you, Stuart. It was another super presentation. Um, we have to leave it there. There were a couple of questions left over. We'll try and get those to you and hopefully we can answer those.